Dr. Kaldorf, welcome to Contagion. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. So let's just start this conversation with your background and some of what you were doing before SARS-CoV-2. Uh, well, I've been working with infectious disease outbreaks for a long time. And one of my research areas are how to quickly detect uh, uh, new disease outbreaks, whichever uh, disease it is, and to develop the epidemiological methods that allows public health officials to uh, detect outbreaks as soon as possible, because if you detect them sooner, you can implement countermeasures much sooner, which will save lives. So, for example, uh, uh, most state health departments uh, use the methods I've developed uh, as well as internationally. And one example is New York City, who in 2015, I think it was, there was a big Legionnaire's disease outbreak in Bronx. And that was detected with the method that I had developed. Uh, and that allowed them to sort of, even if it was only maybe two or three days earlier than it otherwise would have been, uh, those two or three days can be critical because there were several people who died. And uh, if they had detected it later, more people would have died. So that's one area of, of infectious disease technology that I'm working on. Another one is uh, vaccine safety to uh, monitor the safety of vaccines after they have been approved. And what has changed in your line of work since the advent of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic? Uh, well, it was sort of a, a, a shock, not that we have a pandemic, because we all know that sooner or later we'll have a pandemic of some type. So that was not a surprise, but it was surprised the reactions to the pandemic because it didn't fit with my scientific understanding of infectious diseases. And where did that lead you? I mean, have you entered the discussion? I know you've published literature recently or published uh, news? So in March, April, I wrote uh, up a few things. Uh, and one of the pieces were published in English language uh, 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 magazine. And a few other things were published in the major newspapers in Sweden. But it was very difficult, actually, to publish. Uh, back in March, April, as well as now, there are many things we don't know about uh, COVID-19. But there's one thing that's very critical that we do know, and that is that the risk of mortality from COVID-19 is very different by age. It differs by thousandfold. So if you're old in your 70s or your 80s, you're more than thousandfold times at risk compared to children. So while this is a very dangerous disease for the elderly, uh, for children, it's uh, much less dangerous than the annual flu. And for people in the 20s and 30s, it's not at all a dangerous disease at all. So what sort of shocked me or what uh, was surprising is that there was a general universal lockdown on everybody. And what would make sense from a public health perspective to minimize mortality is to protect the elderly better than what was done while letting younger people uh, live their lives and eventually build up herd immunity that then protects the elderly also, once that is established. Mm -hmm. But instead of protecting the elderly and uh, letting the young live their lives, uh, many places close the schools to protect children uh, who are not at risk, while they were sending uh, uh, nursing home patients back, sick uh, nursing home patients back home to the nursing homes after the hospitals. And that was sort of the opposite of what was the logical public health action for COVID-19. Now, has entering this debate introduced any kind of professional pressures for you? I know that the climate around, well, the temperature is very high on a lot of these discussions. I'm just curious, did anything in the field, because you are talking about, for you, a change in what you thought the, the kind of mainstream opinion would have been of what you do about an outbreak of a respiratory virus. Has the culture in the field changed? What are you seeing? 
So among my personal uh, colleagues who I know personally who works on infectious disease epidemiology, uh, I think there's a similar bewilderment, bewilderment among most of them. And most of them are uh, uh, in agreement with my thoughts on this. So uh, the shock is more about reading what scientists outside of the field, what they uh, write about uh, COVID-19, which doesn't make sense, I think, from a public health perspective. Very interesting. Now, if we could go into a few of the different, because when you say the words, for example, you've written a lot about the phenomenon of herd immunity. Now, you say herd immunity isn't a strategy. Could, could you explain that? Yeah, uh, so herd immunity is a scientific phenomenon that uh, is well established. So it's, it's a fact, just like gravity is a fact in physics, herd immunity is a fact in uh, uh, infectious disease epidemiology. So uh, whether, and in, in COVID-19, because of its nature, because it's so uh, infectious and there are so many asymptomatic uh, people, it will be impossible to, uh, in the long run, to uh, handle this disease without reaching herd immunity. So whatever strategy we use, we will eventually reach herd immunity. Now there's two basic ways of doing that. The best way to get herd immunity is through a vaccine, uh, like we have for measles, for example. Uh, the second one is to do it through natural uh, immunity, natural disease. Uh, we don't have a vaccine for COVID-19, so uh, uh, how do we then do it for uh, with natural disease? And the key then is uh, to protect the elderly who are at high risk and let the younger people who are low risk to build the herd immunity. And we don't know what percentage is needed uh, of the population to be immune to have uh, herd immunity, but suppose it's 40%. It might be much more or much less, but suppose it's 40%. Then the key thing is once once we reach herd immunity, we, want, we don't want older people to be among those 40%, because the more older people there are in the 40%, the more death we're going to have. On the other hand, if it's mostly young people in those 40%, we can have very few deaths due to COVID-19. So the key in the strategy is to say, well, we want as few of the elderly to be among these infected people uh, and have more young people there. And that leads to a strategy where we don't lock down the whole society across the board with all the age group, but we make sure that the elderly is properly protected, that they... Uh, uh, that they don't have to go to the supermarket, but so they can have home delivery, for example, that they don't go to restaurants, uh, that they don't uh, participate in large gatherings, uh, that they don't, uh, uh, that in nursing homes, that the people working there are either immune or they are tested regularly to make sure that they are not sick so that they will pass it on to the nursing home uh, uh, residents. So we have to do a much better job protecting the elderly at the same time as the young can continue to live their lives. And then when the young has built up the herd immunity that will come sooner or later, no matter what strategy we have, then the elderly can sort of uh, come out of self-isolation. Now, what I've heard is that there's, I've heard before when you raise the nursing home issue that there's nothing that could have been done or that without lockdowns in particular, that there would have been no way to stop the movement of social actors between multi-generational spaces. Now, we've seen there's a willingness to spend untold money on general transmission measures. And then when it comes to this nitty gritty of long-term care facility, the money seems to disappear, right? Or, or there's all these barriers. It's, it's, Lockdown versus no, it's, you don't see people often go, I support lockdown, and also I'm raising the alarm about protect nursing homes. What, what do you think is behind this kind of strange insistence, really, that at the, at the, on the one hand, every life matters, and then on the other hand, there's nothing that could have been done? Uh. 
I don't know the psychology psychology behind it, but for sure, we could have done a better job with the nursing homes. Um, for example, at the very beginning, we could have made a situation where some of the staff uh, stayed uh, uh, full time in the nursing homes, uh, which I think they did in Canada in some places. Uh, at this point of time, when we have a fair amount of people who are immune, it, it makes sense to those who should work in nursing homes should be either those who are already immune who has had the COVID-19 because then they can pass it on to the, the residents or to do frequent testing uh, to make sure that they're not sick, even if they are asymptomatic. Well, and, and there were issues with nursing home administrators even being able to get testing because it was all being directed towards hospitals at a certain point. Um, but what, what I'd also like to ask about is if we're advocating for an age-based strategy, right? And herd immunity, you know, oftentimes people try to debunk or argue the numbers on what level it is for herd immunity. And, but there's this parallel conversation that they're really talking about that's about, you know, the so-called lockdowns and things like that. Um, now, the Scandinavian countries responded differently from uh, a lot of other ones. And then the, in those countries, there was Sweden, which has become a big hot button issue as well. Now, how did these different countries respond? Because I'd say even places like Denmark, it's a bit of a different response than, than the United States, but especially Sweden. And then what do you say to someone who says, look, look at how bad Sweden did. They have this mortality. They have this. Now, I think there's an important discussion about how are we measuring mortality that I'd like to get into. But just off the bat, if you could just give us the age-based strategy uh, interpretation or analysis of what happened in Sweden, including what mistakes were made, um, because I think that that's important for refinement as well. Uh, so you're right. So Swedish strategy has been uh, age-based to protect the elderly while younger people live more normal lives. Uh, not 100% normal, but uh, more normal than the US and the rest of Europe. Uh, the big mistake that was done was done in Stockholm, where they didn't protect the nursing home residents in a very good manner. And one problem was that they had a lot of turnover of uh, care workers so that the same uh, nursing home residents would encounter many different uh, care workers in the same week. And of course, the more people they're exposed to, the more risk they have to get the disease. Uh, so that was a failure of the Swedish uh, uh, response to COVID-19. Uh, uh, but that was particularly also a thing to, to Stockholm and the rest of the country that did a better job with the nursing homes. Uh, one thing that Sweden did was it never closed uh, the schools uh, from daycare to primary school to middle school, so from ages one to 15. They were open throughout the height of the epidemic. And we can now evaluate that. And of the 1.8 million children in this age group, there has been zero deaths. There has been a few uh, uh, cases and uh, less than a dozen hospitalizations. So uh, the children uh, clearly uh, did not suffer from this uh, and with the less risk than from the annual flu season. They also looked at teachers who had uh, the same risk as the average of other professions. So they were neither more at higher risk than other professions nor at lower risk of, uh, than other professions. Uh, and they also actually looked at children who lived with older people. So among people living, uh, among people aged 70 and above, if they live with the working age adults, less than 65, they are at higher risk than if they live with older people. But if they also live with a child aged less than 16, that doesn't increase the risk any further compared to living with a working uh, age adult. So it's clear that uh, keeping the schools open in Sweden did neither have any detrimental effects on children or teachers 
uh, uh, or uh, the spread of the disease at large. It's not the children who's driving COVID-19, it's driven by adults mostly. Do, do you think that that applies to the US context? Because what we're seeing in schools right now is that they, they're rapidly backpedaling on reopening, especially colleges. K to 12, colleges are going online. How, how does the different context of the US, does that matter? Or are, I know that we have often when we bring up schools, we hear about the Israeli uh, incident, but that was a very complex thing where a lot of other things were reopening simultaneously and not many right. precautions were taken within the school environment. So I'm curious what you think the global picture, how much can be extrapolated from Sweden? Uh, yeah, so in Sweden, uh, if the child was sick, uh, they were told to stay home, or if they got sick in school, like a car or something, they were sent home, which is different from the Israeli context where they stayed. But even if, if, if in Israel, there were no hospitalization of any child. So if you open uh, schools and colleges, there are going to be infections, obviously. That's unavoidable. So that's expected. So nobody should be shocked that if you open schools and high schools and universities, that there will be infections on the campuses. That's going to happen. The thing is that uh, many of those infections are going to be asymptomatic, so you'll only find them if you test for it. Uh, and even those which are not asymptomatic, they will be mostly mildly disease. So the key is not that that you that uh, you won't get the disease in these schools, universities. The thing is that it will affect children who have very, very little risk of a serious uh, outcome or mortality as, as well as college students. Now, I imagine someone would raise the argument, what do we do to protect those who are immune suppressed, who are younger with an age-based strategy? Because the generalized lockdown strategy, as blunt as it is, it it purports to have a kind of egalitarianism to it, right? Like if you're, well, we're all in it together, that kind of thing. Now, what does a different kind of solidarity maybe look like in that, uh, in, in the young going in, having some of these restrictions loosened? And I'd also like to ask, are, you, are we looking for younger people to take no precautions are we looking for them to take precautions specifically around older people and the immune suppressed? Uh, or are we looking for them to try not to get to the, the disease even while they're doing things that will inevitably build herd immunity? I mean, there's a couple different ways of, of, of interpreting it. And I think oftentimes people talk at cross purposes. So that's a very important question. And uh, everybody should take uh, general precautions such as uh, washing your hands, not shaking people's hands, uh, and those things. And a good rule of thumb would be that whatever you're willing to do for five years, that makes sense to do for everybody to do it. Uh, and I'm happy not to shake anybody's hand for the next five years. Uh, and the reason for that is because that will... Uh, reduce the reproduction number, which will reduce the percentage needed for herd immunity. So all those things that are easy to do for everybody should be done by everybody. 